Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. Today's big idea is uh, something that builds on the last couple of videos where we talked about quantum mechanics and then entanglement. Today, we're going to talk about fields, in particular, quantum fields, right? Quantum field theory, as it's typically known. And what's going on here is we've already mentioned the idea of fields. We talked about the electric field, the magnetic field, the gravitational field. Very briefly, we didn't go into any details about them. Now we're going to be applying the rules of quantum mechanics to this idea of fields. So far, when we've been talking about quantum mechanics, it's more or less been in the context of a particle or a couple of particles or a spin or something like that. But the big news is that according to modern physics, the world is made of quantum fields. And that should be a little bit puzzling at first glance because we already started with a particle and then we quantized it and found out that it had wave-like properties, right? The electron is a particle, you treat it quantum mechanically, it's a wave function. But we think that in experiments in nature, there are also particle-like properties, right? The electron leaves a track in a bubble chamber or a cloud chamber. It looks like it has a trajectory as if it were a particle. But if we start with a field, and then we quantize it, so we promote it to having a wave function, how in the world are we going to get particles out of that? That is going to be the major idea that we try to pursue today. So first, let's talk about what we mean when we just say fields. A field, we already said, is something that has a value everywhere in space, a value of some sort or another at each point in space. And when I say a value, that's going to be a lot of the tricky part going forward. So we, it's easy enough to draw space, OK? And then a field is basically at every point in space, there's some mathematical object representing the value of that field. So in the simplest case, here's a point x. We'll put a little, oops, let me draw it a little bit more effectively there. X with a little vector sign over it means the three-dimensional vector that locates us in space X. And associated with that point, there is a value of the field phi of X. So the Greek letter phi is often used for the simplest kind of fields in quantum field theory. But it could be something more complicated. So what it means in this case is that phi is just a number. So if, phi, if the field is just a number at each point, then we say we have a scalar field. We talked about scalars before as numbers you could multiply things by. The example of a scalar field, the classic example, the only known example in nature of a fundamental scalar field is the Higgs boson. It took us a while to find it, 2012, but uh, we've done it. There it is. There are scalar fields in nature. The number could be a complex number or it could be a collection of complex numbers, but it's nothing that changes as you change space-time itself, as you rotate or look at different ways. Whereas if the field equals a vector, then guess what? You have a vector field. Look at that. I wrote scalar nature because I have still not developed the ability to write and talk, and I said the word nature. So you know that there are vector fields in nature because you've heard of the electric field, the magnetic field. At every point, there is not just a number. There's a little arrow representing the electric field vector or the magnetic field vector. In fact, there's both. This is the crucial thing that separates classical fields. Right now, we're just being classical. We haven't quantized anything yet. The reason why classical field theory is different from quantum mechanics, where there's still a wave function, right, is because when you have many particles, you don't have many wave functions overlapping. You have one wave function for everything. When you have a set of classical fields, at every point, there are a bunch of different classical fields. So literally at every point in space, the modern field theorist says, in the classical limit at least, there is a value for the Higgs field, there's a value for the electric field, a value for the magnetic field, a value for the gravitational field. And also, as we will see, there are fields for all the matter particles, like electrons and neutrinos and quarks and all those things. They all have fields with values at every point. So. We will get into the different kinds of fields, right? The, the vector fields, there's, there's more than just scalars and vectors, but those are probably the ones you're most interested in. Um, in. When we talked about the 
potential way physics could have gone in the early 20th century if quantum mechanics hadn't been the reality. We could have imagined a view where particles were matter and fields were forces, okay? So classically, there was that dichotomy that particles and fields were playing different roles. Quantum mechanically, fields are everything, and that's going to be part of what we try to understand here. So let's think about how to quantize this idea, right? This idea of a classical field, we want to quantize it. I'm using the word quantize very loosely here. If you read uh, quantum mechanics books, they will try to give you a cookbook recipe to go from a classical theory to a quantum mechanical theory. It's a little bit misleading when they do that, in fact, because there's no one-to-one -one map between classical theories and quantum theories. There are classical theories that have more than one quantum counterpart. In other words, there's there are classical theories that are the limit of more than one very different looking quantum mechanical theory and vice versa. You can have a quantum mechanical theory that has more than one kind of classical limit. So there's no immediate correspondence between classical theories and quantum theories. Nevertheless, because we human beings are so sort of intuitive in terms of classical physics, but not so much in quantum physics, physicists usually start with taking a classical theory and turning it into a quantum theory in some way. That's what we're going to do with quantum field theory, but we're not going to do it in any systematic way. I'm sort of going to tell you the answers in various ways, try to motivate them along the way. So classical particles, just to remind us what we did, have a position, let's say x, right? Remember that? And then we invented quantum mechanical versions of particles and they had a wave function. So quantum particles have a wave function. You may notice that I'm being a little bit inconsistent because I already said that there is only one wave function of the universe. So I really shouldn't say that a quantum particle has a wave function. But in terms of the entanglement that we talked about last time, there can be situations, and there very often are situations, where a single particle is not entangled with anything else in the rest of the world. In that case, it makes perfect sense to talk about the wave function of that particle. So as long as we keep our wits about us, there's nothing wrong with talking about the wave function of a single particle or even two different wave functions for two different particles as long as they are not entangled, which can often be the case. So the wave function looks like capital Psi as a function of x. In other words, for each possible position that the particle could be observed to have, we assign a complex number. That complex number is capital Psi of X, and we call it the amplitude. So this is yet another way in which we are being a little sloppy. When I write Psi as a function of X, usually what you have in mind is the whole function for all the different X's. If you pick out a point, sometimes you will call that, you know, X star or X naught or something like that and write Psi of X star, that's fine. So mathematically, we think of the wave function psi as a map from positions, all the possible positions you could observe the particle to have, to amplitudes. And then the amplitude be a complex number. You square that complex number to get the probability of actually observing the particle to be at that position were you to measure it. And to be super mathy about it, what, what is the set of all positions that a particle could have? Well, we're not being super physics-y about it, so don't think about you know string theory and extra dimensions. In everyday life, the set of positions is three-dimensional. So this is R3, where R means the real numbers. So this is the three-dimensional version of the real numbers, where you have three dimensions telling you which direction you're moving in. So this is a three-dimensional vector space, the set of all positions in flat Euclidean three-dimensional space. And then they get mapped to the complex numbers, a single copy of the complex numbers. So you give me three real numbers that tells me where we are in space, the position x, and then I get, this is x, and then I get the complex number psi of x, single complex number. And then I will square it if I observe where the particle is. The probability of seeing the particle at x is equal to the magnitude of psi of x squared. 
And if, if you don't remember, I think I did mention this very briefly, uh, if a complex number psi equals a plus i b, where i equals the square root of minus one, then the absolute value of psi squared, which is the thing that is the probability, is just a squared plus b squared. So it's always a non-negative number because it's the sum of two uh, squares. And a and b are both real numbers themselves. It's the i that is the complex unit that makes the combination a plus i b be a complex number. Okay. So this story as a whole is what we want to generalize to this set of quantum fields, to the situation where we have quantum fields. Instead of having a position that we can observe, what we'll have for a field is an entire field configuration that we can observe. Okay, So let's just tell this story again, but tell it for fields. Start with classical fields. And a classical field has a configuration, which is to say a value of the field at every point in space. So phi, for example, of x would be the set of all values of phi at all x's. That's the configuration of the field. That's one particular configuration the field could be in. Okay, so. I have to say, this looks like a wave function, right? I write phi of x here, I write psi of x up here. They look like similar kinds of things, but they're really conceptually very, very different. Psi, the wave function, is the thing that you use to get the probabilities. If you added more particles in, you would not add more psi's, you just add more x's into the arguments for psi. Whereas this is a classical field, which means that it has equations of motion. It would have a Hamiltonian, if you like, that told you what energy it had. It could have an action, and you could minimize the action to find what the equations of motion were. But you could observe it, in principle, as accurately as you like. There's no sense in which phi of x is sort of secretly encoding some observational outcomes. It just is its value, and it can be observed as a classical field. Okay. Sadly, the world is not run by classical field theory. It's run by quantum field theory. But this is the idea you have in mind when you talk about classical fields. They look notationally like quantum wave functions, but conceptually they're a very different thing. Okay. So what happens if you try to turn it into a quantum field? Well, quantum fields are going to be things where there's a wave function but the wave function is not a function of position in space. It's a function of field configurations all throughout space. So they have a wave function, capital Psi, which we'll write with square brackets as a function of some particular field configuration phi of x. So what we imagine here, it never actually happens in real life, what we imagine here is the thing that we're measuring is not the value of phi at some point x, but simultaneously measure all throughout space what the value of phi is. This number, psi, is a complex number attached to every specific configuration phi can have throughout the world. Okay, And then we attach a complex number to that, square it to get the probability. So this phi of x is a field configuration, just to be super duper explicit about this, throughout all of space. And this psi is the complex amplitude associated with that particular field configuration. So in other words, in quantum field theory, you have a wave function of a wave a wave function of a field that is stretching out all throughout the universe rather than just uh, the wave function of a single particle. And then psi squared, where psi is a function of phi of x, is the probability of observing or measuring the field to have the configuration phi of x. It's beginning to seem hard on the field theory, right? Because we've already had to imagine doing this observation of a field all throughout space, which we can't actually imagine doing in the real world. But conceptually, there it is. Now, in a real working quantum field theorist would imagine, in fact, observing the field point by point at different locations or in different regions of space. And you can use this wave function of the large field configuration 
to calculate the probability of getting different outcomes at different points in space. But again, conceptually, this is the thing that is the, the center of the universe, the actual description of the universe in quantum field theory. So to say that in mathy words, because we like to say it both in English and in more mathy words, um, to be mathy about it, let, let's invent some notation here. Let capital F of R3, R3 is just space, three-dimensional space, the real line times itself three times. Let F of R3 be the set of maps from R3 to R. That's supposed to be an arrow there. That's supposed to be R. Okay. So we're imagining in particular, just to make our lives easy, that 5x, our field, is a real scalar field. So at every point, it's just a number. It's just a real number. There are also fields that are complex or multi-valued or vectors or whatever. We're just imagining it's a real scalar field. So this R3 represents space. And this R represents the value of the field. So this is x, and this is 5x. So f of R3 is the set of all field configurations, the set of all maps from R3 to R. And then psi, the wave function, is basically a map from f of R3 to the complex numbers. It's a map that says, you give me a particular field configuration all throughout space, I'll give you a complex amplitude. Okay. Now, sometimes, notationally, you will hear this uh, psi as a function of a field configuration referred to as a wave functional, because sometimes when you go from finite dimensional vector spaces like R3, right, like the positions x, to infinite dimensional vector spaces like f of R3, this, by the way, is an infinite dimensional vector space, sometimes they think of elements of infinite dimensional vector spaces as functions and functions of functions as functionals. This is the word that is used. So sometimes we use we use the word wave functional for this. But you know what? Usually in quantum mechanics, we do not make big distinctions between finite dimensional and infinite dimensional vector spaces. We just say it's the wave function. So I'm just going to say it's the wave function. It's just a wave function for a set of quantum fields. OK, so again, this seems whew, seems a little bit complicated. <laughs> seems, well, more particularly, it's not the complication that worries us. What, what worries us or what might be worrying you is we take this field, which is already not very particle-y, and then we make a wave function of it, which is not particle-y either. How in the world are we supposed to say that this represents our universe, which seems to be full of particles, at least when we observe them? That's going to be the tricky part, OK? How do we get particles out of this? It's easy enough to say that we go around assigning complex amplitudes to every possible field configuration. But let's see it in action. Let's actually get some work out of it, OK? So consider the simplest possible field theory, not just a real scalar field. But remember, these fields have dynamics. They have equations of motion. And so when you tell me I have a real valued scalar field, or I have a real valued vector field, or a complex field, or whatever, you're not done telling me what the field is. You have to give me its equation, right? You have to give me the way it evolves. Does it interact with other fields? Does it interact with itself, etc.? So the simplest possible thing is to consider a non-interacting field. A field that doesn't interact with other fields or even with itself in a way that I'll make precise in just a second. And the technical term we use here, not very technical, is free. So this is not free in the in the sense of free beer. This is free in the sense of it's free to do whatever it wants. It's not interacting. It's not being bumped into. Okay, uh, it's like you know free from slavery, not free from paying for your dinner. So this is a non-interacting free field. And it's a scalar field, a real scalar field, et cetera, OK? So let me, in fact, let's mention, let's imagine it just in one dimension, OK? So here is, let me do that again, because I'm going to want to do it twice. Here is space, x, and here's the value of the field. We're thinking classically for a moment here. So let's, we can do it in another color to make it stand out. Uh, the field is 0 most places, but there's a little bump in it here 
and a zero, and there's a little bump in it there, okay? And this bump is moving to the right. This bump is moving to the left. And we will label this bump, bump A and bump B. Maybe even though I'm not gonna be able to draw it very effectively, uh, maybe bump A has some particular wiggles and bump B has some particular wiggles. For a free field, uh, you can imagine that those wiggles can maintain their shape to some extent. And then what's gonna happen over time is that as a moves this way, B moves that way. It will evolve into a new configuration. And the point of being a free field is they will just go right through each other. These two bumps, these two perturbations, these two excitations or whatever you want to call them in the free scalar field do not interact with each other. So after some time, what you're going to see is a field configuration that looks like this. That's B and that's A. So B is still moving that way. A is still moving that way, and despite my poor drawing skills, they're supposed to be more or less unaffected by having gone through each other, okay? It may be that they're both individually waving up and down, but they're not affecting each other. So that's a simple example that we can think about. It's a sensible starting place for our investigation. And so we're going to consider the quantum theory of a free scalar field. That's, that's our job, and we're going to show how it gets us to particles somehow. So remember that any field configuration, any a field configuration is just a function of space, a real valued function of space, okay? So any function, remember when we talked about Fourier transforms or Fourier analysis, any function can be written as a sum of sine waves, essentially, sine waves with different amplitudes and different wavelengths. I use the word amplitude there. It means something completely different, different heights and different wavelengths. So any function can be written as a sum of sine waves. And what I mean by sine waves is sort of the most general notion of a sine wave, just a wave that goes up and down with a constant uh, period or a constant frequency, if you want to call it. Uh, it could be a cosine just as well, but sine waves is the, is the general term that we'll use here. And this is the Fourier transform. And I'm just stating it. I'm not going to prove it. I'm not going to give examples. You just need to remember this fact, okay? You don't understand this fact. That's fine, but it's a fact you should be able to say back to me. Can any function be written as a sum of sine waves? Yes, it can. And uniquely, we can do, you give me a function, you give me some field configuration, I can figure out exactly the combination of sine waves that would reproduce it. So I start with something that is some arbitrary function, right? Doing something like that. That is my 5x as a function of x. And I can write it as a sum of things that look like some long wavelength mode plus some things that look like a little shorter wavelength plus some things that look like an even shorter wavelength plus dot dot dot. If I pick correctly, and there's a mathematically correct way of doing this, if I pick correctly the different wavelengths and the different heights for these sine waves, I can add them together to make any function I want. And it's absolutely unique and it is uh, reversible. I can go backwards. I can go from the sine waves to the function. I can go from the, sine, from the function to the sine waves. And we call each one of these a mode of the field. Okay, a Fourier mode, one of the contributions in this way of thinking to how to describe that particular function. Now, just as a note, just because you're going to say, well, I've drawn these pictures in one dimension, what about three dimensions? So there's a three dimensional version of this, okay, three spatial dimensional version. Um, it's hard to draw a sine wave, an oscillating wave, but you can visualize it. You can visualize, for example, a sound wave, right? If you've ever visualized a sound wave moving through space, there's a, a plane in which it's more dense air, and then a plane oops, right next to that, in which the air is less dense, and then more dense, and then less dense, and these vibrations in density are what make a sound wave. So we will sort of conceptualize a plane wave, as they're called, in three dimensions as exactly that, sort of a set of planes moving in some direction, okay? So this is all three dimensions of space, x, y, z, uh, and there's a vector, k. k is called, cleverly, the wave vector. And the wave vector says what direction the thing is going in. 
K also says, uh, let me see if I can get this right. Yeah, K also tells us the wavelength. So the wavelength here is the difference between one peak and one other peak, and we call it lambda traditionally. So these planes that I've drawn are supposed to be where the function in three dimensions has a peak. Remember, it's a sinusoidal function going up and down. And in between the planes, it gets to be a trough and then a peak again. And so the wavelength lambda is just the distance, the number of centimeters or whatever, in between two peaks. And k is related to the wave vector in the following way. Or sorry, lambda, the wavelength, is related to the wave vector by lambda equals 2 pi divided by the length or the magnitude of k. Okay, One of these ubiquitous 2 pi's that appears in physics. So what this means, all you need to know, forget about the two pi's, I don't remember where they go all the time. What you need to know is a big wave vector corresponds to a small wavelength and vice versa. So the wave vector uh, contains almost all the information you need to know about to reconstruct the plane wave. This is called a plane wave because of exactly what it looks like bunch of planes traveling, waving. And the other thing is, of course, you need the height of the wave. So the if we just draw a cross section and we draw a sine wave, then lambda, the wavelength, is the distance between two peaks or two troughs. And let's call it h to be the height. And I will warn you ahead of time, I'm going to have trouble remembering that because the actual word that scientists use to, be, to refer to the height of a sine wave is the amplitude of the wave. But that's a use of the word amplitude that has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. It's just a synonym for height. And so since I've already told you that amplitude is the complex number that you square to get the probability of observing something, i.e. a certain value of the wave function, I don't want to reuse the word amplitude for the height of a sine wave. So let's just call it h, the height, okay? And I'll try to, rem I'll try to remember that. This, this will be my job to remember that. So just like in one dimension, every single function can be written as a sum of sine waves appropriately chosen. In three dimensions, every single function can be written as a sum of plane waves. And the plane wave will be specified by the wave vector k, pointing and giving you the, the uh, wavelength, and also the height, the size of the wave. So given any field configuration three dimensions, I can write it as a sum of plane waves. And I call these, once again, modes. The different modes are each mode has a wavelength and it has a direction given by the wave vector. Okay, now also true is that each mode has an energy. There's an energy <laughs> for each mode for a plane wave. And there's different way that's different contributions, just like a particle moving in a potential has a kinetic energy and a potential energy. A wave also has a kinetic energy. And it can be thought of as one half the rate of change of the field over time squared. So if I took the derivative with respect to time of phi at any one point, and then I squared it, multiplied by a half, integrated that over all the points in space, I would have the total kinetic energy of the field. Now, space is big, space is infinitely big, R3, right, the set of all points, okay? So this is really the kinetic energy at a point, the kinetic energy density, the thing that we would integrate over all of space to get the total kinetic energy, but that's infinite. This is the finite thing, so this is what we care about. There's also a new thing, we had kinetic energy for particles too. There's a new thing called the gradient energy, because there's a something that a field can do and a particle can't, which is it can vary from point to point in space, not just from moment to moment in time. But the formula, the sort of pattern is exactly the same. You calculate the rate of change of the field over space, and you square that. So in other words, if I have a field that is very languorously changing from point to point in space, it has a low gradient energy. If it's vibrating really, really quickly in, in space, forget about what it's doing in time, but if it's just changing very rapidly from point to point, it will have a lot of gradient energy. The gradient is the gradient is just yet another word for the slope of the field, how fast it's changing over space. And finally, the field can also have its own potential energy. And in principle, 
that can be something very complicated. It can be a complicated landscape. So for every value of phi, the potential energy is just the energy that doesn't depend on how the field is changing in either space or time. It just depends on the value of phi. But we said we're looking at a very simple case of non-interacting free fields. And in that case, the potential energy takes a very simple form. It is one half times a parameter, which we'll call m squared for right now. Don't ask me why. Well, I'll tell you why in a second. Times the field value squared. So the potential energy, unlike the kinetic and gradient energy, potential energy is something that we choose when we invent our theory. The kinetic energy and gradient energy are basically fixed for a scalar field theory. Potential energy can be more complicated. And when we quantize it, so we're, we're, we're choosing the simplest possible thing, 1 half m squared phi squared, basically, right? And then what we're trying to get to is from quantum fields to why we observe particles. And guess what? This parameter m that we choose when we invent our theory will be the mass of the particles. So there is a parameter in how we define our field theory that will eventually tell us what the mass of the particles is. And also, by the way, k, the wave vector of a certain mode, will be the momentum. I'm going to try, once again, I'm not necessarily um, promising to be very good at this, but I'm going to try to reserve k for the wave vector of a plane wave that we're going to use as a mode that decompose into which field is decomposed. And what, what we're going to do is analyze the field mode by mode, one mode at a time. That's a good thing to do. Um, but then when we make it into particles, particles will have their own momentum. The particles associated with a plane wave of wave vector k will have momentum k. But usually what's going to happen very quickly is that we're going to use all this machinery of plane waves and modes and all that stuff to let us start talking about particles, even though we're doing quantum field theory. And then once we start talking about particles, I'm just going to use the letter P for their momentum, just like we always do when we talk about particles. But it's the same thing. It's the same concept. OK. So these are the different contributions to the energy of a certain mode, a certain plane wave of our field. OK. Again, this is just a simple way we can analyze the field by breaking it up into these modes. It works especially well for non-interacting fields, but it's a good starting point even when we look at interacting fields. And then what we're going to do is we're going to notice something, namely every single one of these expressions we wrote down has the field squared in some form, right? Either the field itself squared for the potential energy or the rate of change of the field for the kinetic energy or the rate of the change of field over space for the gradient energy. So if we have two plane waves that we consider and they're the same except for different heights, so same wave vectors, okay, just the height is different then the kinetic energy, the gradient energy, and the potential energy will all change proportional to the height squared. If you change the height of the field, then its kinetic energy will have to change because it has further to go when it's changing in time. If you change the height of the field, the gradient energy will change because it is now moving more from point to point because you've increased the height of the sine wave. Okay. So what we notice is that if you, if we, that all the energies. are proportional oops, to h squared, where h is the height of the sine wave, the amplitude, if you want to call it that, of the plane wave, of the mode that we're looking at. So let's plot this, OK? Here is the height of a certain mode. Here is the energy. And it doesn't matter whether we're thinking of the kinetic, the gradient, or the potential energy. They all transform the same way when we let the height go up. And it looks like this, h squared. Okay, There's some proportionality constant there, but that doesn't matter to us. What matters is how the energy changes as we change the height. Okay, So I forget actually whether uh, we talked about this concept, but the idea of uh, a parameter that you can change, and when you change it, the energy of the system just changes with, uh, as h squared on both sides, positive h and negative h, uh, this has a name. It's a famous name for a physical system. It is the simple harmonic oscillator. It is 
the one of the simplest physical systems you can imagine um, thinking about. It's the spherical cow of, of quantum mechanics, the simple harmonic oscillator, because for the simple reason, we're going to be able to solve all the equations exactly for a simple harmonic oscillator. A more physical example of a, of a simple harmonic oscillator is a wall with a spring. And on the spring, there's a box. I think we talked about this particular example. And then the spring has a strength k. Sorry that it's k again. That's what it is. And the energy, the potential energy, v of x, if this is the position x, is 1 half, sorry, 1 half k squared times x minus x naught squared, where x naught is the equilibrium point. So the box moves, slides along a frictionless surface. It wants to be at its equilibrium. If you stretch the spring or compress the spring, the energy goes up as the displacement squared. That's an example of a simple harmonic oscillator. But what we're saying here, I mean, this is pretty awesome stuff. I don't want to you know, undersell this because this is like crucially, crucially important. What we've done is taken a lot of simplifications. We've imagined a field that is not interacting, just a scalar field, a free field, and we've decomposed it into modes, right? Into plane waves with given wave vectors and different heights. And we've said, as the height changes, the energy of the mode changes as that height squared. A negative height is just we're measuring it down in the sine wave rather than up. It's the same thing, so it's going to be symmetric around zero. And in fact, there's this good physical argument that we gave that the energy is proportional to h squared. So the system of a single mode can be thought of as a simple harmonic oscillator. That is very good news physics-wise because, man, people have analyzed simple harmonic oscillators to death. In fact, you could do this box that is attached to a spring. There are plenty of systems in quantum mechanics, when you first learn quantum mechanics, that act like simple harmonic oscillators to a very good approximation. Um, a hydrogen molecule. So a hydrogen atom is a proton with one electron around it. A hydrogen molecule is two protons with two electrons that keep them together. And if you imagine perturbing the distance between those two protons, it acts just like a simple harmonic oscillator. So there's many, many systems in physics that have this simple harmonic oscillator form. And what we want to do is quantize this simple harmonic oscillator. Okay. So remember what we're doing here. We have the wave function. For our field, but we're decomposing, uh, is that the right word to use? Yeah, decomposing our field into a sum of modes. We're expressing it as a sum of particular modes. And so we can look at the wave function of each mode separately and then sort of combine them at the end of the day. So let's look at the wave function of a mode, a single mode. That means a single plane wave with a fixed wave vector and a fixed height uh, and all that. So this is psi of phi and this is a single mode of phi so it is parameterized by h the height of the mode and k the wave vector that's all you need to know to tell me what exactly mode i am talking about and a wave function is going to tell me the probability of observing that mode to have a different height different wave vector okay in fact actually this is probably I'm, I'm realizing this is probably not the best way to say it. Uh, the mode is fixed by the value of k. So let's write the mode itself as phi sub k. Okay. So phi sub k is a mode, in other words, a plane wave with a certain wave vector and a certain size of the wave vector and direction in which it's pointing. And that field configuration corresponding to that mode only depends on the value of h. I think that's the better way of saying it. Given the wave vector, we know what the plane wave is doing. We just don't know how big its deviations are up and down, how much the field is actually oscillating. That is what is fixed by this height h. h is the maximum value of oscillation of the field up and down. So even though we have this complicated field, phi is a function of x everywhere, by looking at it mode by mode, and we realize that if you tell me what the wave vector is, the only thing that varies to tell me what the mode is doing is its height, I have turned this complicated wave function of the whole set of field configurations into a wave function of a single number, h, right? 
And furthermore, I know what the energy of H looks like. As H changes, the energy goes like H squared. It's a simple harmonic oscillator. So this is a quantum mechanical system that I know how to deal with. And I say quantum mechanical because this, actually I should have said this a long time ago. There are people who think that there's quantum mechanics and that quantum field theory is somehow another theory past quantum mechanics, okay? That is not the way of thinking about it. You have non-relativistic quantum mechanics and you also have quantum mechanics of point particles. You also have quantum mechanics of fields and the most popular quantum field theories are relativistic quantum fields. We're not gonna worry about the fact that they're relativistic, but these quantum fields are compatible with the rules of special relativity, which we talked about in the space-time video, okay? So my point is that when we do quantum field theory, we're not replacing quantum mechanics. We're doing a version of quantum mechanics. Nevertheless, some people, including myself, will sometimes lapse into a lingo which uses the phrase quantum mechanics to mean the quantum mechanics of a particle or a finite number of degrees of freedom, as opposed to a field that has degrees of freedom at every point, an infinite number of degrees of freedom, okay? By taking our field, writing it as a sum of modes, and thinking about only the height of each mode, we've taken this complicated quantum field theory problem and turned it into a set of very, very simple problems because every mode is just a function of one variable, h, and we can do quantum mechanics of that single variable. So let's do that, although by do that, I mean I'm gonna tell you what the result is. I'm not really gonna like solve the equation in all of its glory. Let me just redraw the plot of the energy, okay? So this is the value of h, and this is the energy of the mode, so this is the energy of phi sub k as a function of h. And it looks like this. It is a parabola. It goes like h squared. So remember when we talked about the electron in the hydrogen atom? We said that even though the electron had a wave function, the wave function was perfectly smooth, you want, for physics reasons, and I think I, I explained this best in the Q&A video for the quantum mechanics lecture rather than in the actual uh, quantum mechanics video itself. Look at the Q&A video. Um, you want the wave function to go to zero at infinity, far away from the nucleus of the atom. There's a competition where the electron wants to be close to the nucleus, but also the wave function of the electron, if it varies too quickly, if, it, if its gradient is too large, then that costs a lot of energy. So the minimum energy state is one where the wave function of the electron is bunched up near the nucleus and it goes to zero. There is a next highest energy where the wave function of the electron varies a little bit. It wiggles once, but nevertheless, it still goes to zero far away from the nucleus in all directions. And this is a very common phenomenon. It is exactly like, as we keep saying, a string where you tie down the two ends of the string and then you pluck it, right? There is a lowest note that you can uh, get, the fundamental of that, and then there are overtones or harmonics from that which have more than one wavelength in them, okay? So that is the origin of discreteness in quantum mechanics. It is not because you start with discrete ingredients, you start with this field and you quantize it and get a wave function of it. But when you solve the equations, you find that the solutions come in a discrete set. That's also true for the simple harmonic oscillator. In fact, it's easier to see in the case of the simple harmonic oscillator. You can solve this and guess what? Because the energy is going towards infinity up here, if you go out high enough, there's never a point where the energy stops growing, okay? The energy, it costs more and more energy for the height of the wave to be bigger and bigger, right? So if you want to look at modes of this toy problem, this, you know, remember, this is just one little part of our big problem. Our big problem is quantizing the field. We have chopped that big problem down into a set of little problems. This problem is quantizing a single variable, the height of the sine wave. Its energy goes as h squared. And if you want finite energy solutions to the quantum mechanical problem of just this one mode, those wave functions for h better go to zero at infinity, because as you go to higher and higher heights, it costs more and more energy, potentially an infinite amount. If you never come down, it will cost you an infinite amount of energy. So there are a discrete set of solutions to this equation. There is a lowest energy solution, a next higher energy solution, a higher energy solution after that. And in fact, one of the reasons why the simple harmonic oscillator is nice is because the energies are exactly 
uh, evenly spaced between each other. The difference between lowest energy and next highest is the same. So if you plot the energy levels, here's energy of level n, uh, here's n equals zero, n equals one, n equals two, n equals three, and it's the same distance in energy, okay? So to go from one energy solution to the next highest is an equal change every single time. And what I mean by this, I, to visualize this, I should have drawn this, here is the form of the wave function of lowest energy, call it psi zero of h. This is really psi of phi of k of h, but just keep in mind that we're fixing what k is, and we can just write it as psi of h, okay? And so this is the lowest energy mode. It has an energy, which I'll tell you later, but right now it's the lowest energy mode. And then there is one that is next higher in energy that looks like this. Psi one of h. And then there's one next higher energy after that. Is green good? Yeah, green is good. Looks like this. This is psi 2 of h, etc. The point is, I, I've said it before, but I'm going to keep saying it because it's just crucially important. Um, we start with like the smoothest thing in the world, this field that is stretching out through all space, and we have a wave function of that field. But then when we look at the lowest energy state the field can be in, it's a sum of modes, and every mode will be in its lowest energy state. We can also have states of the field of slightly higher energy by taking one of those modes and bumping it up into its next highest energy state, okay? And there's a discrete difference in energy between those two possibilities. And the number, uh, the amount of energy that you change by as you increase what mode you're looking, what, what energy state you're looking at is the same every time, okay? So there is an interpretation of this. I should, let me just say one other fact about this. Um, the pinning down here of the, mo of the modes, I keep saying modes, the pinning down of the wave functions, these all go to zero at minus infinity and plus infinity, okay? It's a little bit different than the electron. The electron in the nucleus, in, in, the, in the atom, uh, was had a wave function that was non-zero near the nucleus and went to zero at large physical distance away from the nucleus. This is a more conceptual thing. So I'm asking you, you know, this is not an easy thing. I get it. I'm, I'm asking you to bear with me for a little bit of a conceptual leap here. This is the wave function is going to zero as h increases. So this is a wave function of a mode parameterized by its height. What it's saying is we don't know when we measure this mode how high it's going to be what the height of that particular mode is going to be because quantum mechanics, right? Because all we can do is predict the probability. These colorful lines that we've drawn are the wave functions for different states the mode could be in, and we would square them to get the probability of observing the mode to have that height. And what we're saying is, because we want minimum energy states, because we just start with zero energy and then build from there, all of the modes will have the property that there's very, very, very little probability of ever measuring the mode to have too much height because that would cost too much energy. So they're pinned down at large values of the height of the mode, not at large values of distance from the nucleus, but the math is the same. Now, okay, now is the big reveal. There is basically an interpretation of this. And I wish I could do a better job at explaining why this is a good interpretation, but it is a good interpretation, and maybe I've justified it enough. The real thing is that, you know, there's this constant difference in energy between these different energy levels. The interpretation is psi zero, the lowest energy state of the mode that we're looking at, can be thought of as a collection of zero particles. It is the lowest energy state. It's the vacuum state. It's something that is just there. There's nothing happening. There's nothing moving around. It's the lowest energy state you can be in. There is a state that has slightly more energy, and that we interpret as a state containing a single particle. There is a state that has slightly more energy than that, psi 2, and that can be interpreted as a state that has two particles in it. And this goes on. There's an infinite tower of states, psi n, which you can think of as having n particles. 
Why does that make sense? Well, there's a cheap and easy way of, of having it make sense. I mean, think about the, the, these are all for a single mode, for, so for a single wave vector, so for a single momentum of the particle. If I give you one particle in a state, just classically, one particle with a certain momentum, it'll have a certain energy. If I give you two particles with exactly the same momentum, the same kinds of particles, it will have twice that energy. And if I give you three particles with the same momentum, the same kind of particle, you know, three electrons moving in the same direction, three times the energy. So these equally spaced energy levels are at least consistent with the idea that we can interpret them as describing different numbers of particles. Now it goes way beyond that. You can actually do, you, could, you can dig into this and you can do an exact correlation, an exact map between the wave function, not just of the height, but also of the position in space. You can make wave packets by superimposing different modes on top of each other and find that if you have like a bunch of different modes, all of them are in their n equals one state. All of them are supposed to be, you know, one particle. That's just a complicated wave function for a single particle. It acts exactly like that, okay? This is why quantum field theory is a theory of particles, because you can think of the theory, you can think of the individual uh, fields as being described by a set of different modes. And the modes, because of this harmonic oscillator kind of behavior that it costs energy for the height of the mode to be big, have discrete sets of solutions to the Schrodinger equation with discrete energies that are equally spaced and therefore can be thought of as describing different particles. Now, you want to be more than that, obviously. You want to do more than that. You want to describe why these modes when they hit a cloud chamber will leave a trajectory, okay? And that comes down to a different feature. You know, we can't answer that question at this level because we assumed from the start that we had a non-interacting field. This is not an electron. The electron has to interact with the cloud chamber to leave a track behind. So to answer the question of why particles leave tracks is a bit trickier. And the answer is, of course, the answer relies on the fact that the interactions between the electron and the rest of the world are local in space. The electron only interacts with things that are right next to it. That's why it leaves a track. We talked a little bit about that back in the time when we were talking about force and energy in action. And we talked about momentum uh, versus position and velocities and the Hamiltonian, all that stuff. It's locality that makes things look particle-like. This story just justifies why you can start with something as wavy as you can get, right? The wave function of a set of fields, and it can be interpreted as a set of discrete particles. So in fact, that is the punchline, and I'll just write it again because it's worth saying. One quantum field can be thought of in the right circumstances, and these circumstances are right so far, but they'll be more complicated ones, but can be thought of as a superposition of different numbers of particles. In fact, this is one way to invent quantum field theory. We invented quantum field theory by saying, let's say we have a field, let's quantize it. You can also invent quantum field theory by saying, let's say we have many particles and try to come up with a convenient mathematical way of characterizing all the particles at once. And what you would do is end up inventing a quantum field. It's the same thing. So by superposition, I mean, you know, we decomposed our wave function of quantum fields into wave, individual wave functions of different modes. But the real whole shebang, the big thing, psi of phi of x is a superposition of all those different modes. And every mode can be a superposition of these different energy states. Okay, So not only does this particular quantum field it, not only could it describe one particle or two particles or three particles, it can describe a set of particles. You don't know how many there are. When you observe it, there's a probability that you'll see three particles or 12 particles or whatever. That's the beauty of quantum field theory. And in fact, you can observe it at different times and the number of particles can change. I'm not going to justify this, but there is a, there's a folk theorem, which means it's not really a theorem, but there are good arguments uh, in favor of it that says that uh, if you want quantum mechanics and special relativity, and you want to be able to change the number of particles, 
change number of particles. The only way to do that is in a quantum field theory, QFT, quantum field theory. So there's a justification for why things need to be quantum field theories. That's the only way to obey all of these uh, cherished principles all at once. Okay, did I get that right? Yes, I think I got that right. So that's why we have we start with quantum fields, we get particles. It's, it's at least, again, I didn't justify it all the way, but I tried to make it seem like a plausible thing. Now, we're not done. <laughs> we're not done with quantum field theory. Uh, we have a long to-do list, okay? We're not going to do it all today. We'll, we'll do some of it later on. Um, we'll do a lot of it. But, you know, quantum field theory is hard. Like, quantum field theory really is the combination of hardest and most important subject in physics, is what I would say. You know, you can argue that, you know, some specific, uh, very technical field of high temperature superconductivity or string theory or whatever is harder than quantum field theory because we don't know what the rules are, etc. But those are only interesting to some people who are specialists in those fields. Quantum field theory is central to modern physics, and it's really hard. In part, it's really hard because there's a lot of infinite quantities, you know, the dimensionality of various Hilbert space is infinite. As we'll see, there's a famous problem in quantum field theory with an infinite uh, answer to certain well-posed questions. What is the probability that these two electrons bounce off of each other? If you calculate it sloppily, you'll get an infinite answer, and that's bad. This is the problem of renormalizing the infinities, okay? So there's a lot of subtleties that go into quantum field theory, but it's crucially important. It's absolutely central. Right now, quantum field theory is the best way we, having, we have of describing nature at its deepest level. So the hardness is worth it. We should, we should do it. So what we'll have to do, in not necessarily this order, is imagine that there are different types of fields. So we mentioned that already. So there are not only scalar fields, there are vector fields, there are tensor fields, like the gravitational field. I'll explain what that means. And there are even spinner fields, which are not vectors or tensors, things like the electron, the neutrino, etc., cetera, uh, fermions, as they are called, the matter particles are made of spinner fields. And I'll, we'll, we'll get into that, don't worry. So different types involve the scalar, oops, scalar fields like the Higgs, vector fields like electricity and magnetism, now, the cognoscenti in the audience will know that secretly the electric and magnetic fields are not vector fields after all. They're both part of a single tensor field. We'll get to that, and it's worse than that because there is a vector field from which they both get derived, the vector potential field. I'll, I'm just you know shouting out to the people who know what is going on here. The electric and magnetic fields come from an honest vector field, even though they're not honest vector fields themselves. Um, Sometimes, usually in particle physics, these come from gauge fields. And that has to do with a certain symmetry that the fields have. And we'll try to explain where that symmetry comes from and why it's important in the forces of nature. And then you also have uh, fermion fields, spinners. Spinners spelled in a weird way, O-R-S, not, it's, 1n ors not 2n's ers not a set of things that spin but spinners is the mathematical formalism and these are matter particles right electrons quarks etc so there's an enormous amount of richness in quantum field theory because there can be many different types of fields and then the richness continues because you have to let them interact right and the way that you do that is the simplest way, the sort of first step in learning how to let them interact, is by thinking about Feynman diagrams. So what I did here, all of this stuff, is to sort of justify why, under the right circumstances, you can think of a single quantum field as a superposition of a collection of particles. And then Feynman diagrams sort of take that license and really put it to good use. They say, good, let's just do particle physics. Let's imagine we have a certain set of particles to start, and it does quantum mechanics. The particles interact, and they evolve into a superposition of different numbers of particles outgoing. So you might have, for example, uh, two electrons, E minus, E minus, and the Feynman diagram will say that they scatter off of each other time is going this way by uh, exchanging a photon 
Photons are usually denoted gamma, the Greek letter gamma in uh, particle physics, okay? So we'll have to understand what's going on here, how you can use this cute little picture to actually calculate the probability of this kind of interaction happening. And then we have to talk about, you know, that messy set of issues that I mentioned, infinities, renormalization, some theories can be renormalized, some can't. It's an issue, etc. Okay, so there's a lot of conceptual issues that we have to get on with. There is one thing I should probably, it's, on, it's an hour, my computer's telling me it's been an hour. Um, we're not gonna talk about any of these things today. I'm gonna end the video. But there's one thing I really do wanna talk about because it is not talked about um, in most discussions of quantum field theory, but cosmologists care about it a lot. And that is the issue of the energy of the vacuum. So in ordinary quantum mechanics, you have a certain number of particles and that number of particles remains fixed, right? In quantum field theory, when you really have a field, you can interpret that as particles, but the number of particles comes and goes. It turns out that in quantum field theory, even the zero energy state, even the state of lowest possible energy is still an interesting place. So the vacuum in quantum field theory is the lowest energy state. And the reason why it's interesting is because you still have, at every point in space, there's still, you know, the quantum mechanical version of phi of x, right? There's still some quantum state for the field that is filling all of space. And indeed, the lowest energy state in quantum field theory is uh, superposition of the lowest energy states of all those modes, right? So I can take every single mode of my quantum field, which is purely hypothetical, right? Like, remember, a classical field has a configuration. A quantum field has a wave function over the set of all configurations. So even if we're in the lowest energy state, we don't just say the field is zero. We say the field has a wave function. If you observe the quantum field, even in the vacuum, you can get any answer. There will be a non-zero possibility of you getting any particular value for the field if you observe it, because the wave function doesn't ever go exactly to zero. Okay, It goes to pretty close to zero. It eventually goes to zero when you get to infinity, but you never get to infinity. So at any one point, you have to actually, that was that was mistaken. Infinity in energy, at any one point in space, you have a value that of the uh, field phi of x that you could always get in principle. You can't get phi equals infinity, but you get the same answer at every point in space. Okay. So even the vacuum is an interesting place in the quantum field theory. And you say, well, okay, it's the lowest energy state. It's a state with zero particles, right? In quantum field theory, you have the vacuum, the lowest energy state. You have states with one particle. You have states with two particles, etc. And the set of all those things is the set of states that the system can be in, that the, that the thing can be in. Why would the vacuum be interesting? Well, you see, look at this yellow line here. Conceptualize that. Maybe I can just, I always am slightly um, nervous when I try to cut and paste in this program. This is not the program I usually use. Copy. Good. What are the chances I can paste it, huh? I think I did this once before successfully. Paste, huh, it worked. <laughs> I could do that 20 more times in the course of these videos. I will always be pleasantly surprised. Okay, the point is for a classical particle in a potential like this, let me see if I can find yet another color to use. Uh, here's blue, okay? So here's a classical particle. I'm comparing a classical particle in a potential to a quantum wave function in exactly the same potential. So I'm not sure how visible this blue is, but the classical particle, now it's not visible at all, is it? I'll use white again. Minimum energy of the classical particle
in a potential v of x equals, let's call it for future reference sake, 1 half omega squared x squared. Okay. I know that this picture I wrote h, but we're just doing the general idea of a quadratic potential, of, a, of an x squared potential. That's the simple harmonic oscillator at its essence. So what is the minimum energy state? Well, kinetic energy of the particle can be zero. The particle can just sit there. It doesn't have to move. And the potential energy of the particle can also be zero. It can be at the minimum, at x equals zero. So total energy can also be zero. The minimum energy of a classical particle in this potential is zero. I'm belaboring a point that you are not surprised at all to hear. But look at that yellow curve there, right? That yellow curve is changing. That's the minimum energy quantum wave function in the same potential, but it's not just a point sitting at the origin, right? It has some support everywhere, it sort of spreads out a little bit. So we can calculate the energy of that profile. You know, we, I, I didn't over here, you know, when we were talking about those, I said that they were equally spaced, but I didn't tell you by how much they're spaced, or I didn't tell you what the first one was. So that's math, you just do it. You plug into the Schrodinger equation. It's still the Schrodinger equation, even in quantum field theory, there's a version of the Schrodinger equation. Don't believe people who tell you the Schrodinger equation applies only to non-relativistic particles. Um, the equation Schrodinger himself wrote down does in fact apply only to non-relativistic particles, but it's easy to generalize. The Schrodinger equation is h psi equals i d by dt psi. The Hamiltonian acting on the wave function is i. There's an h bar in there that is, I said, equal to one times the time derivative of psi. And that's true for any theory that you have. You just have to give me what h is, what the Hamiltonian is. It works equally well for quantum field theory as for anything else. Okay. So what is the energy of this quantum thing? The quantum thing is in yellow here. So the energy of the lowest energy state in quantum theory, quantum minimum energy, Ah, I'm trying to squeeze things in so my handwriting is becoming less good. Well, you work it out. It equals one half, let's call it E naught, one half h bar omega, where omega is this parameter that appeared in the potential right there. So it's not zero. It's greater than zero. Omega is a positive number, okay? Um, there, the, there's a minimum energy in the quantum theory that is different than the classical theory. And in fact, it's a little bit, it goes beyond that. I can actually tell you what the answer is uh, for the other energy states. The energy for n particles equals uh, n plus one half times h bar omega. So what is that? That's the energy of all these different wave functions, psi zero, psi one, psi two, they're all psi n, where n plus a half times h bar omega is the energy. So the zero energy state has one half h bar omega. The next highest state has an energy three halves h bar omega, two particle has five halves h bar omega, etc. Okay, it almost never matters what the energy of the lowest energy state is. What matters is the difference in energy between one excited state, as we call them. There's the lowest energy state, the ground state, and then any other state is called an excited state. It's excited to be having more energy than the ground state. The differences in energy, which in this case is just some multiple of h bar omega, those matter because you can see them. If you have a particle or some system that is in an excited state and it undergoes a transition to a lower energy state, let's say by emitting a photon, much like an electron in an atom goes to a lower energy state and then emits a photon, then you can measure the change in energy, the difference in energy between two states. So usually in physics, the ground state energy itself doesn't matter. After all, if we just took this potential and let's say we added a constant to it, plus C, we raise the whole potential up or down, it doesn't change anything at all, anything measurable, except and there's one thing that it changes. I'll erase that here just because we don't want it. Um, one thing that it changes is the energy of empty space. Remember, um, 
this is supposed to be the real world. And this is saying there are fields in empty space. Those fields could have energy. So let's imagine you did the following thing. Um, let's imagine you set the classical energy of empty space to zero. Why? Well, because we said so. That's, <laughs> that's, we're not going to even justification. We're imagining that's what you chose to do. The field, the quantum field, is a superposition of an infinite number of harmonic oscillators. the modes of the quantum field, the plane waves, right? That's what we said, the quantum field, this is just a general fact, the quantum field can be thought of as a superposition of all these different modes. You can put every single one of those modes into its lowest energy state, but all those lowest energy states still have energy, even though they're the lowest energy. This is the extra quantum bit over and above the lowest classical energy. So quantum mechanics, QM, contributes an infinite energy to empty space. That sounds bad. <laughs> it is bad. This is known as the cosmological constant problem. Einstein, remember Einstein, uh, maybe not remember, maybe you never heard the story, but back in 1917, Einstein already had general relativity. He figured that out in like 1915, 1916, and he was applying it to the universe as a whole. And he was looking for a solution to his equations that had you know stars distributed equally throughout the universe, which is kind of prescient. Uh, it wasn't obvious that that's how things were, but now we know that distributing galaxies equally throughout the universe is a pretty good approximation. And what he found is that the universe would either expand or contract. Those are the two possible solutions. There was no solution where the universe just sat there static. And he asked his astronomer friends, uh, is the universe static? And they said yes because that's what they thought in 1917. It was the 1920s where Hubble discovered that the universe is actually expanding. So Einstein figured out a way to add a new term to his equation for general relativity, which he called the cosmological constant, and it sort of pushed things apart, and it created a balance. The matter was trying to pull things together. The cosmological constant was pushing things apart, so he could find a solution to his equations in which, in which the universe is neither expanding nor contracting, the so-called Einstein static universe. Now, we now later reinterpreted Einstein's cosmological constant as a measure of the energy density of empty space. And Einstein, once he realized the universe was expanding, he was like, ah, that was a bad idea. Get rid of the cosmological constant. Nowadays, we've discovered it. We've discovered the universe is accelerating. Uh, in 1998, astronomers discovered that, and we attribute it to the cosmological constant. The problem is... The cosmological constant on the one hand is just a free parameter. You can pick it. You can set it to be whatever you want. If you're God and setting up the rules of the universe, you can make it whatever you want. But it seems like the difference between your classical theory and quantum theory is infinitely big when it comes to the cosmological constant. So whatever the observed cosmological constant is, here's the logic that people go through. And we don't know if this logic is right. In fact, somehow it has to be wrong, but this is, here's the logic. The logic is, Wherever you get the cosmological constant from, you can always think of it as a classical piece plus a quantum piece. And naively, if you figure out the quantum piece, it's the sum of the zero point energies, the vacuum energies of an infinite number of modes, an infinite number of simple harmonic oscillators. So literally at every point in space, you should have an infinite energy density just from the quantum contribution. Now you can make the classical contribution equal to minus infinity. You could exactly cancel it, right? But there's no reason to. There's nothing special or good about zero cosmological constant. And now things have gotten worse because in 1998 we discovered we don't have zero cosmological constant. We have a small but non-zero value. 
That's crazy. We have no reason to think that we should have a small but non-zero value of the cosmological constant. If it were zero, like when I was a graduate student, everyone thought it was zero. And we said, well, we don't know why, but there must be some symmetry that makes the cosmological constant exactly zero. And people said, well, let's look for that symmetry or some dynamical mechanism or something like that. When we discovered it in 1998, that there was a non-zero cosmological constant, but that was nowhere close to the quantum mechanical contribution by itself, everyone is now more puzzled than they ever were. So the solutions, the search for solutions to the cosmological constant problem are ongoing. Um, not to get too far out of what we're supposed to be talking about here, but the here's how bad it is. The best solution on the market to why the cosmological constant is small is the anthropic principle. If you imagine there are different parts of the universe where the cosmological constant takes on different values, then if it were really big, infinitely big, or even finite but really, really big, you wouldn't be able to form a galaxy, right? It would just blow everything apart. The cosmological constant either, if it's large and positive, pushes matter apart at a tremendous rate, or if it's large and negative, causes the universe to recollapse very, very quickly. In order to get a universe that lasts long enough for galaxies to form, but doesn't blow them apart with a super fast accelerated expansion, the cosmological constant has to be small. So if you live in a multiverse where the cosmological constant takes on different values in different places, we living complicated organic beings who rely on a long lived universe with galaxies in it to exist would only ever find ourselves in regions where the cosmological constant is small. I'm not saying that I agree with that answer or that I like it, uh, but it's on the table as a possible answer. And in fact, I, I can say in my judgment, it's better than any of the alternative answers as of right now. So really what that means is not that the anthropic principle and the multiverse are right, but that we don't know why the cosmological constant is small. And it's a very interesting way to get at the kinds of problems that come up when you try to marry quantum field theory with gravity. Of course, we're talking about the biggest ideas in the universe, so we're going to get to some of the ways you can try to marry quantum field theory with gravity eventually. First, we have to do a little bit more understanding of quantum field theory itself. Our journey is not yet over.